All right, thank you, Robert. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm sure most of you on here uh, probably recognize me from previous meetings, but for anyone, any of you who might not, uh, my name is Rachel Clark. I am a Fresno Audubon president. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us. It's great to see you all here with us this evening. Uh, we have a really important presentation in store for us tonight. Um, Rachel Zwillinger, who, or Zwill, Zwillinger, if I pronounce that incorrectly, I apologize, who is Waters Policy Advisor of, uh, for um, Defenders of Wildlife California program, will be talking to us about drought and its impacts on migratory birds right here in the Central Valley. Uh, before we get to that though, um, I do have a few quick announcements. I would like to thank all of you who have joined who have joined at Fresno Audubon on our recent outings and have helped make these events a success. Our next outing is scheduled for this coming Saturday, December 18th. And that will be, uh, we'll be going to Roding Park. We will be meeting at 7.30 a.m. at the Pond by Storyland. Um, the outing will last until approximately 12.30 p.m. Now the walk itself is free to join or it's free to attend. However, there is a $5 entry fee at Roding Park that can be paid um, at the kiosk on the way in. Uh, registration is required for this event. So um, once I'm done, I will drop the link in the chat box for registration for anyone who might be interested. Um, the next thing I'd like to talk about is the Lost Lake Christmas Bird Count, which is coming up uh, this Sunday, uh, December 19th. Uh, if you are interested in helping out this year, uh, please feel free to either send me a message in the chat box or reach out to me via email. I'll be uh, dropping my email address um, in the chat box. So yeah, feel free to message me there or to uh, send me an email. Um, again, this year, as we did last year, we will be following social distancing protocols uh, to ensure everyone's safety. So we're asking that people either count separately or only count with you know, members of the same household or the same uh, social pod. And I also kind of wanted to put it out there. I know some people think, oh, it's a you know, full day of birding. I, you know, that, that's a little bit too much. If you don't want to come into a full day of birding, that's perfectly okay too. If you want to just devote a few hours or even just an hour, that's perfectly okay too. We'll take all the volunteers we can get. And um, some of you might not be familiar with what the Christmas bird count is and what it entails. So feel free to reach out to me with any questions that uh, you might have. And I have one last thing before we get to tonight's presentation. Uh, Nathan Parmeter, who uh, should be here with us, will be talking to us very briefly about a Christmas bird count that he is organizing. So Nathan Parmeter, if you are here, I am gonna hand the floor off to you. Let me see if Nathan is here. Let's see if I can find Nathan. Okay. Well, if Nathan is not here, um, we will skip that and pass the floor over to Rachel a little sooner. Okay, then I will go ahead and see if I can easily share my screen. All right, awesome, yep, floor is yours. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm just looking for my presentation to be able to share there. All right, sorry, that took me a minute. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to figure out how to maximize this. Anybody has an easy tip? Down on the bottom, bottom toolbar, you see that little, uh, yeah, that's it. There we go, wonderful, thank you. All right, hi there everybody. I'm Rachel Zwillinger with Defenders of Wildlife and I'm really pleased to be able to be here with you this evening. Um, I am going to be talking about drought in California Central Valley, how drought is affecting our wetlands and what that means for migratory birds. But I thought I'd start off with just a little bit of background about Defenders of Wildlife, the organization um, I work for. Defenders was founded in 1947. The organization is dedicated to the protection of all native animals and plants in their natural communities. Um, among other things, we advocate for the protection of threatened and endangered species using a variety of tools, including advocacy in Congress, um, representation in the courts, and a lot of on the ground work. And that's in addition to a bunch of other work that we do. Um, we are a DC based organization and also have six field offices that you can see here spread across the country. 
Um, I work out of our California field office. Um, our program is based in Sacramento, but we actually have staff spread all over the state. Um, and here you can see some of the focal landscape and key issues that we work on. Um, I'm located in Marin County, and that's where I'm talking to you with you from tonight. Um, and I focus on water and wetland issues. For water issues, I spend a lot of time in the Central Valley focusing on the Bay Delta Estuary and its watershed, um, San Joaquin and Sacramento Rivers, and all of the various um, policies and legal efforts affecting species in those important waterways. And then I do statewide wetlands work, but really focus on wetlands in the Central Valley for reasons that will hopefully become clear as we talk more about the importance of Central Valley wetlands for the Pacific Flyway. So with that, let's go ahead and get to the subject at hand. And, you know, I'm not sure what everybody's background is, but I thought I would start by talking just a little bit about why wetlands are so important for wildlife. So across the United States, over one third of threatened and endangered species live exclusively in wetlands. And almost half of all listed species depend on wetlands for at least a part of their life cycle. In California, wetlands are critically important for migratory and resident birds, as well as the variety of other species, like fish, salmon that are migrating through our Central Valley rivers rely on wetlands, um, mammals, reptiles, amphibians. I really think of wetlands as the nurseries for much of our state's wildlife. Pacific flyway birds rely on California wetlands um, as a spot to rest and refuel as they move along their long journey. So as I'm sure you all know, the Pacific Flyway is a 4,000 mile bird corridor. Um, and this California Central Valley is a really essential component of Pacific Flyway habitat. So the Central Valley supports about 30% of shorebirds and 60% of all of the ducks and geese that migrate along the Pacific Flyway. Around 3 million ducks, 1 million geese, and 500,000 shorebirds overwinter in the Central Valley annually. And altogether, about 400 species of birds use the valley during all or a part of their life cycles. Um, and this is why so much of my wetland work focuses on the Central Valley. Um, in the Central Valley, migratory birds, waterfowl, shorebirds, others rely overwhelmingly on wetlands. And that's a bit of a problem um, because wetland losses over time in the Central Valley and throughout the US have been profound. So across the continental US, 53% of our wetlands were lost between the, 19, the 1780s and 1980s. Um, after that, there were stronger environmental laws put in place that at least slowed the pace of destruction. In California, overall, less than 10% of our historical wetlands remain. In the Central Valley, it's even less than that. The loss of wetlands in the Central Valley has been particularly profound. Here you can see in these figures um, in blue the wetlands that once spread across the landscape and what we are left with today. So I thought I would spend to understand sort of the impacts of drought in the broader context. I think it's helpful to understand sort of the key parts of wetland habitat in the Central Valley today. And I really think of there being three key types of wetlands in the Central Valley. There are many others, but these three categories of wetlands make up the bulk of habitat and food resources for migratory birds that come through the valley each year. The first of these three categories are the CVPIA wetlands. CVPIA stands for the Central Valley Project Improvement Act, which was a federal law that was enacted in 1992. And among many other things that it did, it dedicated um, pretty secure and senior water supplies to 19 wildlife refuges in the Central Valley. These are in national wildlife refuges, state wildlife management areas, and private lands. Now, all of these 19 wildlife refuges are what we refer to as managed wetlands, which, remain, which means they are 
cut off from the rivers and floodplains that once naturally fed them with water because our rivers have been dammed and diverted and levees have been built. And so now, instead of receiving natural flood flows in the winter, they are irrigated and require water deliveries, much like agriculture. And that's important in, in, when it comes to talking about water deliveries in the drought context. But so these 19 CVPIA refuges that are all protected lands with firm water supplies that create wetland habitat, I think of them being as sort of the backbone of habitat um, in the, for the Pacific Flyway in the Central Valley. The land is secure, the water rights are secure, they're well managed, and they're a really, really important piece of our wetland puzzle. Um, the second category of wetland habitat that's really important for migratory birds are rice fields. Um, the Sacramento Valley particularly used to be, you know, I think of it as a big bathtub that in the winter, the rivers would overtop their banks, these beautiful lands would flood, and we would have wetland habitat for birds throughout the valley. Much of that land today has been replaced by rice agriculture. Um, this rice agriculture provides really important surrogate wetland habitat for birds at certain times of years. Um, and particularly after the rice is harvested, some farmers choose to get rid of the rice stubble that they have remaining on the fields by flooding the fields at the end of the growing season in the winter. When they do that, by flooding the fields, it makes the, the waste grain from the leftover from leftover from harvest available to the birds. And this leftover waste grain in the flooded rice fields in the winter is a critically important source of food for shorebirds and waterfowl migrating along the Pacific Flyway. And then the third category of habitat types that we think about is a sort of less well-defined category, but these are duck clubs. And so private managed wetlands that are flooded up with the primary purpose of hunting, but which are a really important piece of um, the mosaic of wetlands in the valley. So all of these three wetland types, which are so important to the many, many migratory birds that come through the valley require water and they require sort of managed water deliveries to turn these otherwise dry lands into wetlands. And these days, water is in unfortunately short supply. So I'm sure you all know, 2021 was a record dry year, our second dry year in a row, and really catapulted us into a pretty profound drought. This comes on the heels of another major drought in 2014, 2015, um, and other years around then, that I think has made more clear the impacts that we're going to see from climate change, which is an expectation that we will be having more frequent, more intense droughts that are then punctuated by some very wet years like 2017 in between, but it feels very much, and the science is showing that drought is going to become the new normal. Here you can see, this is just a photo of, I believe this is Orbel um, up on the Feather River at historic low levels. And then DWR very regularly updates these charts with reservoir levels compared to average reservoir levels for this time of year. And this was pulled a week ago maybe, but you can see that our reservoirs after the 2021 water year are in pretty bad shape. So with this sort of thinking about drought as the new normal, um, for those of us interested in bird conservation, it's important to think about what does this mean for the Central Valley wetlands that are so important for providing habitat for the birds? So I'll go through the, the three habitat types that we talked about in turn to talk a little bit about what happens to their water supply. First, the CVPIA refuges, then, um, rice agriculture, and then duck clubs a little bit. So first, the CVPIA refuges and drought. Um, this figure, I need to update it to include more recent years, but I think it does show what happens during drought. Now, the top of the red bars is the amount of water that the 19 refuges should be receiving pursuant to the Central Valley Project Improvement Act. 
If that law was faithfully implemented, that's the volume of water they would be receiving. The yellow bars are the amount of water they are actually receiving. In many years, there are, you know, I can explain if people want to discuss in the QANA why they're not receiving their full allocations in the other years. But what I wanted to show in this chart are the 2014, 2015 years, which were sort of the most profound drought years in the last drought cycle. And there you see that the water delivered to the refuges drops substantially. And that is despite the fact that these refuges have some of the most secure and senior water rights in the system. They have um, contracts that allow the Bureau of Reclamation to reduce the water supply to the refuges by 25%. And then sometimes we've seen them get cut even further than that. So the amount of water that they're getting is dropped. And then what does that mean on the ground? So these are some pictures at one of the Sacramento Valley refuges. I believe this was the Sutter refuges that I took um, during a flyover in 2015. And what you see here are the managed wetlands and the ones that are blue are those that received water. The ones that are brown are you know, these landscape managed wetland units. You can see the islands and other things that are helpful for providing vegetation resting spot for the birds that these brown parcels did not receive the water deliveries that they were supposed to receive. And so they are bone dry and provide no wetland habitat. So if you think of being one of the several million migratory birds flying over the valley looking for a spot to rest and refuel um, when these units aren't flooded during times of drought, the habitat available to you gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And we'll talk about why that becomes a concern um, in a little bit, but, but it's pretty clear that in these drought years, when water supplies to the refuges are produced, the landscape starts to look more and more like this, rather than the beautifully flooded parcels that provide so much habitat. Um, we talked a little bit before about how rice is so important for birds and um, rice is also impacted during drought. In an average year, there are about 500,000 acres of rice grown in the Sacramento Valley. And I think these acres, I think of them as being affected in three ways by drought. First, there are some parcels that are fallowed because of low water supply. So they just don't get the water supply that they are expecting. Um, and they don't grow crops. These brown parcels that you're seeing next to the green are the ones that have been fallowed. Another thing that happens are what we've called water transfers, where these growers in the Sacramento Valley, for the most part, have very senior water rights. So even in a year like 2021, they were allocated substantial water. Sometimes they decide instead of using that water to grow their crops, they sell it to somebody else, maybe to an urban area, maybe to an almond farmer, um, down in the San Joaquin Valley, they make decisions about what to do, but that leads to fallowing of the land um, instead of growing crops because the water that they would have applied to the landscape for crop growing, they're selling to somebody else. Then the third impact is that we saw in 2021 particularly that the water supply that was allocated to, these, to the growers they front loaded and used for growing as much rice as much rice acreage as possible, rather than saving some of that water and prioritizing the rice straw decomposition that's so important for the birds. So we actually saw in 2021 that there was still a lot of rice on the landscape in this historically dry year. The best information I have suggests it was cut by about 100,000 acres. So down from 500,000 acres of rice to 100,000 acres. I think a lot of that was from water transfers and some of it was from just low water allocations. But what really got hit hard was the rice straw decomposition acres. In an average year, um, we see about 50% of planted rice acres, um, they apply water in the winter to de decompose the straw, which is what's good for birds. This year, it was dramatically, dramatically less. I don't have the final acreage. Um, and there were some emergency efforts that I'll talk about later that got a little bit more water on the landscape. But that's what we saw being really hard hit in terms of the perspective for birds was, was the rice decomp practice, which is really what makes the food available. 
And then the duck clubs um, are, you know, privately owned, privately managed, and there's not as good information about them. So it's harder to understand what's happening, but because of curtailments and limitations in surface water rights, and also because of um, groundwater overdraft and problems with being able to access wells, duck clubs that relied on both surface water and groundwater um, were hit this year. And the expectation is that we saw dramatically less duck club habitat on the landscape than we would in a better water year. So, you know, we've talked a little bit about drought and what it means for wetlands. And then the next step is to think about what does that mean for birds? So the things that we're really concerned about for birds are overcrowding and avian disease, botulism and cholera. And like that photo, the aerial photo that you saw of the landscape when the birds are crowded into fewer and fewer wetland acres, they're much closer together and we get really concerned about disease outbreaks. Also become concerned about poor body condition and reproductive impacts. If there isn't enough food available um, to, to ensure that all of the birds who are in the region can fuel up enough to safely make it back um, to their breeding grounds in good condition, it becomes a real concern. And then people are also concerned about changes to migratory routes because of limited habitat availability that the birds will just start going elsewhere. Um, in the Central Valley, over the last several drought cycles, we have not had major disease outbreaks, which I think everybody has felt like has been a little bit of a miracle. We've had late rains some years, I mean, early rain, sorry, some years and various other things that have um, staved off disaster. Up in the Klamath Basin, they have not been so lucky. This, I believe, is a coot that was um, up in the Tule Lake Refuge. And there, um, last year, there was a botulism outbreak that killed an estimated 60,000 birds. And they've had really bad disease problems that are caused, among other reasons, by drought and limited water supply availability. Just another anecdotal sort of piece of evidence, I think I read in a, in a, in a news report recently that one of the refuge managers at the SAC National Wildlife Refuge um, estimated that by the end of the third week in October last year, in 2020, the rough waterfowl count was about 80,000. And this year in 2021, it was about down to about 60,000. And we don't know exactly why it was, if birds are going elsewhere, if there was less reproductive success, exactly what happened, but it's certainly concerning. What I have found also concerning um, doing this work is how little we really know about how drought impacts birds. In the Central Valley region, it isn't something that has been exhaustively extensively studied in the past. Um, thankfully, with sort of a robust state budget this year, there has been funding for some big new research projects that have new um, monitoring equipment and where people from groups like Audubon California, Point Blue Conservation Science and others are getting out on the landscape to do some more rigorous studies to better understand what these water supply and wetland acreage reductions really mean for bird populations and for the Pacific Flyway. So I feel optimistic that in the next sort of, I guess, well, depending on what happens with water, um, but that in the next three to five years, we should have better information about how drought is really impacting these important populations. So with that little bit of gloom and doom about drought and wetland diminishment and very sad bird pictures, what are we doing about this? And I thought I would start with some of the emergency actions that we took this year. Um, to try to help Central Valley wetlands and the birds that rely on them. So first, because the CVPIA refuges have senior water rights and do get water even in very dry years when other um, interests are allocated no water supply, those water, so the, the water rights of the refuges come under attack. We see this in le legislative proposals, we see this in court, we see it attacks on their funding, 
And so a lot of the work we do is trying to defend the very important water rights for these Central Valley refuges. Another thing we focused on this year on sort of an emergency basis was making sure that there was funding available to repair and improve groundwater wells for some of the Central Valley wildlife refuges. Some of these refuges have access to groundwater, but their ability to get water onto the landscape at these really critical times was um, limited by aging inadequate infrastructure. And so we worked hard to get funding to fix some of these pumps and canals and other pieces of the water delivery infrastructure to try to get as much water onto the landscape as quickly as possible. And then a third thing we did in the emergency drought action sort of bucket was seeking and receiving funding for incentive programs for rice farmers to winter flood their fields. Um, I think there was some federal support. The Department of Water Resources provided about $8 million to help get more rice decomposition water onto the landscape. And with the really limited water supplies available this year, um, that extra wetland habitat, I think from all the reports have I seen was important. Um, and so it was nice to see that happen and turn the, you know, the state to invest in that important um, habitat and to turn it around pretty quickly. So that was great. And the slightly longer term planning with respect to drought response, um, one of the big things defenders and other groups are doing is looking for new water supply sources for the Central Valley wildlife refuges. Part of that is trying to fill that little red bar that you saw in the chart with the water deliveries to, to get closer to making sure the refuges receive full water deliveries all year, in all years, and then particularly making sure that they have some drought resilient supplies. Um, some of the projects that have been exciting in that expanded refuge water supply space in recent years have been the North Valley Regional Recycled Water Project, which was a collaborative effort to get some recycled water to the refuges, which is a wonderful new source. And then another project that's looking promising is the Los Vaqueros Reservoir Expansion Project. That is a reservoir in Contra Costa County that um, the water district is working on expanding and they are using some money from the 2014 water bond proposition one to do that, which means they also have to provide ecosystem benefits and the ecosystem benefits that they're proposing to provide with the state's investment in that reservoir are water supplies for refuges south of the Delta. And that could be a really exciting new source that could also allow the refuges to receive water that doesn't have to go through the big delta pumps, which is often a problem with respect to limited capacity at those pumps. Um, another thing we're working on in the longer term planning category is trying to improve water transfers to avoid and minimize wildlife impacts. So those rice idling water transfers where the rice farmers sell their water instead of growing rice um, can wipe out a really large amount of habitat on the landscape. And there are ways that the water transfers can still go forward um, with, with lesser impacts to birds and other species. These are things like growing non-irrigated cover crops on the fallowed parcels. Um, there's some evidence that that shallow flooding of the fallowed parcels at particular times of year is really beneficial for shorebirds. Um, there are also ways the fallowing can occur by checkerboarding, for example, the parcels that are fallowed so that it ensures better habitat connectivity for giant garter snakes. So there are a bunch of things that we're trying to get included into the approval process for water transfers to say, if we're gonna have um, a system where we can sell water to the highest bidder. Let's make sure we're avoiding and minimizing impacts to wildlife. And then finally, we're really trying to improve um, access to stable funding for wetland priorities. Um, and we've made some progress in this space, but at both the state and federal level, the funding sources that are so important for refuge water delivery infrastructure and for purchasing water for the refuges, um, it's been difficult to get stable and robust funding for those priorities. And then finally, in 
the long, long term and sort of the much bigger picture with drought response is that to me, the drought really highlights the inequalities in our water management system. That in a year like 2021, we saw huge volumes of water going to senior water rights holders, mostly big agricultural interests. Um, while the birds suffered from a lack of habitat and water available on the landscape, um, we waived water quality standards in the Delta that are so important for endangered species in the Delta and that help to avoid harmful algal blooms, which are impacting communities in the Delta. Um, we wiped out an entire year class of winter run Chinooks and then almost an entire year class of winter run um, by running down the reservoirs too low and running out of cold water. We are, you know, we're driving species, salmon particularly, to extinction that are essential to tribal cultural values um, and to a way of life for these communities. And when drought puts this pressure on all of these different parts of the system, I sort of hope and push for a broader rethink of our society, you know, societal priorities and a rethink of who the winners and losers are in our water allocation and water management system and trying to strive for a California um, where even during dry years, we can continue to support the Pacific Flyway. We can have robust and recovered salmon runs. We can have communities with clean, safe water. Um, all of these things while also having vibrant agriculture, but just seeking a better balance. So that's the sort of overly perhaps big picture in thinking about drought response. Um, and that's what I had prepared for today. And I'd love to engage in conversation, take questions, um, whatever would be most interesting and useful. All right, well, thank you, Rachel. Um, I am gonna go ahead and check in the chat box if anyone has any questions. Uh, please go ahead and put them in there now. Go ahead and open it up and look and see what we get. It might take a few moments for the questions to trickle in. And just to let everyone know, um, <clears throat> since I uh, since Nathan was not able to make his announcement earlier, because uh, he was not able to unmute himself. There's a little bit of confusion there. Um, after the Q&A, I'm going to give the Nathan the floor uh, so he can talk about this uh, Christmas bird count that he is organizing. Okay, so just give it a moment. Or if anyone uh, wants to add, just you know, ask the question, um, feel free to raise your hand, and then the host will unmute you. We have uh, two questions for you, Rachel. Uh, thank you, uh, Nathan, for putting that in the chat box and for sharing that with us. So, uh, Rachel, the first question to you is from Ron Martin. It's, uh, has the Westlands Water District created problems for the Pacific Flyway? So, um, Westlands Water District is, I believe, the biggest agricultural water district in the United States. Um, and is a major user of water from the Bay Delta system. Um, I think there are big problems for the ecosystem as a whole um, related to the water use in Westlands Water District, that they have contracts for volumes of water that they are permitted to take out of the Bay Delta estuary that are incompatible with having healthy wildlife in the estuary and beyond. Um, particularly for migratory birds, I guess there's some argument that the water that is allocated to Westlands could be used for Pacific Flyway habitat um, and that perhaps that would be a better use. But I don't think there's anything, you know, it's sort of a larger question about water management priorities than anything particularly problematic that Westlands is doing. The one impact that has occurred within Westlands um, that has impacted the Pacific Flyway is 
the creation of selenium laced drainage water, that, that there are drainage impaired lands within Westlands Water District where selenium and other naturally occurring materials accumulate when the land is repeatedly irrigated and drained. Um, there were efforts in the past to store that drainage water in open ponds, particularly at Kesterson. Um, and that made the selenium um, accessible to the birds. And we saw major impacts to birds in the Pacific Flyway from selenium toxicity as a result of that drainage impaired water coming off of, I believe, primarily agricultural lands within Westlands and some of the surrounding districts. So that was one concrete problem that occurred from Westlands for migratory birds. It's this problem that doesn't yet have a solution. They have, um, I think, dramatically reduced the pathways to which the birds were exposed to the selenium, but there's still not a great solution for a way to safely get the selenium off of the landscape. In terms of the bigger water management picture, it is a bigger problem with water contracts that are um, incompatible with healthy ecosystems more broadly, whether that is Pacific flyway birds or for salmon migrating through the Bay Delta system. And thank you, Rachel. We have uh, we have a whole slew of um, other questions. Uh, the next question is from Alex Sheriffs. His question is so important. Why would legislature prioritize birds? Um, I mean, I hope because you all are writing to your legislators regularly to make sure that they know that their constituents care about birds in a healthy Pacific Flyway. You know, I, I think that's really the reason, you know, hopefully there are some good legislators out there who just do care about a healthy environment and healthy bird populations. But really, I think it is people making calls and sending letters and speaking up and letting folks know that it's a priority for people in their districts. And that gets them to listen when groups like Audubon or Defenders of Wildlife or others come into their offices to ask them to do something to protect birds. Um, and I think that, you know, the outreach that you all can do is really valuable. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Our next question comes from Ron Martin. His question is, is the Salton Sea, sorry, Salton Sea still an important part of the Pacific Flyway? What is being done to preserve it? Mm. The Salton Sea is still a very important part of the Pacific Flyway. And, you know, part of the drought picture that I didn't touch on is the broader flyway perspective. And that is in a year like 2021, Klamath refuges were bone dry. The Central Valley saw really limited habitat and Salton Sea, which is also really important, was negatively impacted with respect to water availability as well. So when you're a bird migrating along the Pacific Flyway and those sort of three key stopover points along the way are all impacted at the same time, it's a really big problem. Um, for Salton Sea, there was a dramatically long delay in efforts to begin to restore habitat for birds and also mitigate dust problems there that are really impactful for local communities. Um, my sense is that there has been more state attention recently and federal attention and that restoration efforts are underway more meaningfully, um, but that it remains a long road to having a um, sort of a smaller footprint, but one that is still useful for migratory birds coming through the area and that it's a work in progress. Okay, our next question comes from uh, Karen Cobb. Her question is, you mentioned declines in overall numbers of birds on the Pacific flyways. Have species also vanished? Um, I'm not aware of loss of any species in very recent years, but there are a whole suite of birds that are species of concern, including many migratory species that migrated along the flyway that people are really concerned about and the limited habitat availability impacts those species um, significantly. And, you know, for aquatic species, particularly some salmon runs, delta smell, other people, species up in the delta, the, the real threat of extinction and loss of species forever from water management during drought is more 
profound than it is for the birds. Overall, the birds have held up a little bit better than other species have during these really dire years. Okay, our next question is from Judy Johnson. Her question is, were the maps showing the historical and current extent of Central Valley wetlands based on year-round wetlands or were seasonal wetlands included as well? Um, so that was a chart, those maps were created, I believe, by Ducks Unlimited, and I'm pretty confident that they show seasonal wetlands, that, that those are not perennial wetlands, but that those are the wetlands that were historically flooded in the winter to provide habitat for migratory birds. Okay. Our next question comes from Larry Parmeter. His question is, one of the major concerns in the valley is large-scale development. Currently, thousands of houses and complexes are being built due to people moving here. How does this square with the need for more water for wetlands and other ecological programs? Um, so continued development is a big problem, um, both from a water use perspective and from a land conversion perspective. When I think about sort of wetland losses from habitat, from um, urban development and urban sprawl, I'm actually more concerned about the land conversion than about the water use. Um, in terms of water use statewide, about 80% of our developed water goes to agriculture, while 20% goes to municipal and urban uses. And um, the addition of a little bit of, um, of housing and other things on the landscape doesn't make me as concerned from a water use perspective because it's a relatively small piece of the water pie overall. Um, it does make me really concerned from a land conversion perspective. You know, in addition to the protected wetlands that I talked about, the CEPIA refuges and those in agriculture, there are still other remaining wetlands on the landscape that are really important for birds and other species. And some, some wetland types like vernal pools that we have lost in just dramatic percentages. And the more expansion that we see at the urban edge, the more and more we lose those vulnerable wetlands. Um, for the last many years, defenders led an effort to get a statewide wetlands policy in place that creates more rigorous wetland protections um, for things like housing developments and other land conversions that will hopefully help to make it harder for those new developments to occur in natural wetlands. Okay, so our next question comes from Lauren Knapp. Her question is, could you talk about what monitoring methods defenders or other groups are using for shorebirds? And are these efforts coordinated among different conservation organizations to share data and preserve, preserve habitats? So I, I'm a lawyer and I cannot talk about the science and data monitoring in any great detail, um, but there is really good coordination and some really great groups who are doing the work. Um, the groups that are most out on the landscape doing the science work are Point Blue Conservation Science in a really leadership role on the science along with Audubon California, the Nature Conservancy, and then those groups are also coordinating with state and federal agencies, particularly with the State Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, to make sure that we are sharing information and that the information from these monitoring efforts is getting into the hands of the people who are making policy decisions about where water and funds are allocated. Um, so there's a lot of coordination. And I think particularly during drought, that's been one of the bright lights during these last several droughts is that groups, I think some of the, the conservation groups really come together and strategize about what information we need for policy, how to do it, and then do a really good job of coordinating with the state and federal agencies um, to try to use that information to inform their policy. Our next question is from Julie. Her question is, who makes the decision for water allocations during drought years? So, you know, the, the, there are a complicated bunch of legal rules that dictate the, the water system in California. For the most part, we have um, a water rights priority system, which operates by the first in time, first in right rule. So those who were here first, 
um, and first put the water to beneficial use, as it is called, have the most senior water rights in the system. And then those who came to the system later have more junior water rights. When during a drought year, um, the way it usually works is that there's sort of an organized system where the most junior water rights holders, those who came latest, get cut off first. And then you go up the line, up the line, up the line until you get to the most senior water rights holders. Um, so it's not an equitable cut. It's not like everybody takes a 25% cut to their water allocation. Rather, the junior water rights holders lose their whole allocation first, and then it goes up the chain. In terms of who makes those decisions, um, it depends on which water contractors are receiving the water and who has the water rights, but it's some combination of the California Department of Water Resources, the US Bureau of Reclamation, and the State Water Resources Control Board. Um, in recent years, what we have really seen during drought is that those very senior water rights holders who don't get water supply reductions, even in the most um, profound drought years, are taking so much water from the system that it is driving species to extinction. And that's part of the rethink that I think I am interested and other folks are interested in having is seeing if there's rather than just who got here first and took all the water, if there is a more, um, if there's a better path to allocation that protects all of the interests of society rather than a handful of water users who got here first. The next question is uh, from Karen uh, Cobb again. It's, uh, is there any movement to reclaim part of Tulare Lake? Not that I am aware of. That's not to say that there isn't, but I'm not aware of any effort to do that. Okay, and uh, we do have a handful uh, more questions. Uh, they were uh, directly messaged uh, to, to Robert. So Robert, I am gonna hand it off to you and let you read those questions off. Thank you, Rachel. So the first one that I have directly messaged to me is from Kathy and Phil Phillips asking, how can we help as individuals? Um, you know, I think one of the, the best things that you can do is reaching out to local, state and federal elected officials to let them know how important particularly these wildlife refuges are, the Central Valley refuges are to you, to your community, for public access to nature, um, for the health of the Pacific Flyway. And I think the more that local state and federal elected officials hear from their constituents, the more likely they are to do the right thing when they're faced with a request from one of our organizations, from somebody else um, in a legislative context with respect to allocation of funding, any of these things. Okay, the next one is from Julie and she asks, which wildlife refuges have been hardest hit in the drought? You know, I think the refuges, so generally the refuges in the Sacramento Valley do the best um, because they have the most easy access to water. Um, they're in close proximity to the rice fields who have very senior water rights and are able to convey their water. And so the Sac Valley refuges tend to fare best. And then as you move further south through the system, it gets worse and worse and worse. Um, so the, you know, at the bottom end of the system, the Kern and Pixley refuges, those are the ones that are not connected to the state water system, to the Central Valley Project, um, and can't receive those water allocations. They're more dependent on groundwater. They get hit really, really hard during drought. Um, there are also new concerns with implementation of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, which overall I view as a really good thing in getting to you know, a society with more sustainable water use. But, some of those refuges, particularly in the Tulare Basin, are dependent on groundwater, the refuges and duck clubs. Um, and as water, groundwater access is limited because of implementation of the groundwater sustainability law, it could really impact the access to water that some of those refuges have. 
Okay, the next one is also from Julie, and I think you've touched on the answer already. She asks, who makes the decisions for water distribution during drought? I came in late and might have missed this information. I hope that the biggest agricultural players aren't making the decision. Well, officially, the decisions are made by the law and then by the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, Department of Water Resources, and State Water Resources Control Board. Um, but I have found that in this space, the political influence of some of the water districts is profound um, and, that, and that the law is implemented in ways that I don't think is always faithful to the law and I don't think is in the best interest of wildlife certainly, but society at large also. And so, well, the big water districts aren't making decisions about the water allocations, they certainly have a significant ability to influence those decisions. And we have another from Kathy and Phil Phillips. Uh, who are some of the legislators who are sensitive to the flights of birds? You know, I don't do most of our legislative work. So thinking about who the legislative champions are, um, you know, Senator Padilla has been really great on these issues so far. Um, Representative Huffman in my area is wonderful on water issues and birds. So those are the first two um, who I think of at the federal level. And then, you know, at the state level, I, I'd have to sort of go back and look through my materials to, to give you a good answer as to who some of the champions are. And that's all I have in the way of direct messages. Rachel, if you want, there's one more in the general box now. And, and this actually is not a, a question. Uh, this is rather, as Pamela puts it, a shameless plug. And she goes on to say, uh, Defenders is seeking a new California representative to work on renewable energy, land use, wildlife, and habitat issues in the Central Valley and California, California desert regions. This position will be based in a home office. Please help spread the word. And uh, there is a link provided. So anyone who was interested in that position or um, knows anyone who might be, uh, yeah, feel free to jump right here into the chat box and click that link, copy it, and um, yeah, pass it on. Thank you for that. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? All right, well, I'm not seeing any more at the moment, so um, we'll go ahead and kind of start closing it out and I'll pay attention to see if anyone else pops in a question at the last second. That does happen sometimes. So thank you again, Rachel, for the wonderful presentation and thank you to everyone uh, who attended. We certainly appreciate it. Just want to remind you all really quickly that Fresno Audubon in, is on social media. If you're not following us, please, um, if you're not following us already, uh, please do so. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Are also on YouTube, uh, so definitely check that out, especially if you've uh, missed any of our uh, recent uh, general meeting presentations. Uh, we have them all on there. This one will be published on there in a few days if you want to rewatch it um, or if you know someone who missed it and wants to see it. Uh, we hope that you'll join us for next month's general meeting, uh, which is scheduled for J Tuesday, January 11th. Uh, for that meeting, our speaker will be Benny Jacob Schwartz, who will be talking to us about the birds of the tropics. So stay tuned for an announcement and some links for a registration uh, to links to registration for that event. So thank you again, Rachel. And thank you again, everyone who attended. Uh, have a great remainder of your week. Stay safe out there and have a great holiday. Good evening, everyone. Hi, all. Thanks for having me tonight. <laughs>